coffee or here from the Shetland Islands. That's why we can carry out our attack. And then one possibility would be that we would then fly back out to sea and the Royal Navy would have an aircraft carrier out in the Arctic Circle. Eric, I'm, I'm not making this up, I know, due respect to the Royal Navy. <laughs> <laughs> and we would leap out of the aircraft, which if you won't try doing that for a mosquito, uh, is not the easiest task, and parachute down into the sea within the Arctic Circle. <laughs> the Royal Navy would foolishly then stop engines when this area was littered with German U-boats, and if they felt so inclined, they would come and pick us up out of the water. So there would only be 40 of us in the water, we'd all survive the attack, and uh, within two minutes, they would be fishing out corpses. That was one idea. <laughs> Another idea was, if we had drop tanks, we could go a little bit further, so we could come out of Carfield and make our way down to Narvik here, the port of Narvik where there is a railway line and they moved iron ore from Narvik down to Boden in Sweden. And this area in between Narvik and Boden is uh, a massive pine forest. So we could fly down there. And when we ran out of fuel, we would crash on top of the pine trees <laughs> near the railway line and when a train came by, we could stop the train. <laughs> and, uh, I don't think this, this is actually what we were being told. <laughs> this had the advantage that if we made it to Bowden, we would be kept in Sweden, which was neutral. So we could have a cushy life until somebody decided to repatriate us. That appealed to us enormously. <laughs> somebody then said, well, why can't we go to Bayinga? Because here is Mamansk, the Russian naval port, and outside the port is the, the airfield of Bayinga, which had been used by Hamdens and Spitfires uh, previously. We were told that this wasn't possible because of the secrecy of our work, that if we landed there and made the attack from, from Bayinga, went straight to Bayinga, made the attack here, and then flew back to the Shetlands. The probability would be that the Russians would be rather swept up with this idea of attacking the Turpits, and they might take over the aircraft from us. Um, and since that whole area was a hotbed of spies, we'd have to go there two or three days in advance, so the German spies would know full well what our intentions were. It, that worried us because somebody happened to say, well, if the aircraft are taken from you by the Russians, you might then be treated by the Russians as prisoners of war. So that was another option that didn't really appeal. Somebody, Wing Commander Pike, they was, came up to us one day and told us that if we landed at Bayinga, we could then produce our revolvers <coughs> and demand to be refueled with the low-grade Russian fuel. <coughs> and then we could fly out. We pointed out to him, if it wasn't obvious, that since we didn't speak Russian, and since a Russian wasn't about to sacrifice his life at the sign of some foolish airman pointing a pistol at him, uh, the likelihood is that we would have been shot on sight by the Russians then why don't we have a naval ship put into Murmansk for repair, ostensibly? You could land at Bayinga and then walk from Bayinga down to the port of Murmansk, like a day trip. <laughs> so you arrive at the gate of Murmansk and say in English, I am going to board that ship. And the Russian says, I don't understand what you're talking about because I don't speak English. Time went on, and we'd gone from May until June, July. At that stage, we had not even flown all 20 aircraft in formation. We hadn't undertaken a single mass flight. And to make the attack on the Turpins itself, 
Uh, the turpitz is, what, some 280, 800 feet long. It was lying under a bluff, so you could only attack it broadside on, flying into the fjord, round over an island, then leveling down to 60 feet, and with the aircraft 50 feet wide, we would have to go in in four waves of five aircraft 